a good friend of mine. He's going to be talking about the finish of one of the upcoming four zero days and other surprises. Give a warm welcome to Jason. Target, and they want to see how many or which vulnerabilities is that target. Um, 
the bubble too. What's going to work with this? So as a company, I have to ask yourself the question, what kind of target is that? Do that generalize? Well, everybody falls into the bubble. Is the answer to that question. Now, everybody can be a victim. Every company out there can be a victim of being uh, generalized attacks. Because it's zero. It's zero. It's zero day. It's something that will be seen before. Um, but then you also have you know, the targeting attacks. Um, and there, the targets are a little less, uh, they're, they're a little bit more limited. Um, you know, smaller companies or companies that don't necessarily have information or data or systems that. Um, people really want it's going to be less of a specific target than those that do have something that people want. But I mean, let's face it, most businesses are in business to make money and people want money, so almost anybody's a target because of that. So, anyway, um, pen testers, we will notice these trends. Uh, I work for a consultant company. Um, I basically do a lot of pen tests for a lot of different clients. So it's not always the same client. I'm not going to see exactly the same thing every single time. This is what a great thing about what we do is, is every day is different. You know, right? I'm going to have new challenges. I'm going to run into new interesting vulnerabilities that I haven't seen before. Um, but then I, I will often see patterns. I'll see the same sort of thing pop up over and over again. And it doesn't mean every single client is vulnerable to all the same things. It just means that a lot of the same types of issues pop up and they've been around for a long time. Yeah. So, what I want to do is take those things that pop up all the time and relate those to um, some of the fancy named zero days that were announced now, last year. And just kind of show about, you know, why are you worried about this? We also have taken care of all of these other things that are very much related. So, um, so let's start off with shell shock. This one's got a nice fancy name. Um, they don't have a, a pretty picture to go with it, so I kind of made one else kind of <laughs> 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 So, shell shock. Um, also, hopefully, some of you who maybe heard of these vulnerabilities but aren't quite sure exactly what they do, this will help clear that up as well. So, shell shock is that string of characters. That is the shell shock vulnerability. Um, so it's a it's a payload that if a vulnerable version of Bash sees this set of characters in this order, it will execute the command that follows this. And you can see that in a little bit more detail. Robert Graham uh, he tweeted, um, "I'm running a scan right now on the internet to test for the recent Bash vulnerability." Um, so some of you probably remember seeing this. Uh, here is his, his example configuration for uh, mass scan. And um, you can see that there's that same string of characters right there. That's what he's doing, he's basically putting all that stuff in. He's hitting port 80, so that's your usual HTTP port. And he was in several uh, HTTP headers, he was adding that along with the ping back to his own box. So it's actually pretty straightforward, right? Um, note that although he said he's running a scan across the internet, there's only one port on the it was only one page for any web server on the internet, not all the pages of all the websites. It's just basically the root. Um, so you just imagine that if you consider all of the other services out there, other than HTTP, this is you know, it's a very widespread vulnerability. Um, so um, just a bit of a side note on Shellshock. Uh, sounds really bad. It was fixed. Um, but then it had to be fixed again, and then um, <laughs> <laughs> there's several CPDs that basically relate back to the same sort of thing. Um, so the thing with Shellshock is the the main examples that they, they talk about the Shellshock have to do with mod CGI and um, mod CGID. So these are CGI scripts are they're pretty old; they've been around for a long time, um, and Largely, they have been, uh, because mostly because of performance reasons, they've been superseded by other technologies that do the same sort of thing. So we're talking about server side um, code execution um, <laughs> for, you know, for getting dynamic responses back. So, everything from PHP to Java servlets to uh, Ruby on Rails apps, 
there's lots of other technologies out there today uh, that do the same job and tend to do it better, tend to do it in a more, um, I would say, kind of in a more sandbox manner where they, it doesn't have direct access to the underlying operating system so easily. So it's a wonder that we're still using CGI in places. Maybe it's a good idea to look at alternatives. So some some other uh, old technology issues. These are the things that I see with scans all the time. I, was, I, I would say pen tests, except that I don't even get into pen tests before I see this sort of thing. I'm you know, running a scan. And, uh, and it'll be uh, use of unsupported software. So old operating systems. Anybody still run into Windows XP? I do. Sure. I don't yeah, do you know that. That. yeah, it is, right? Is it? There we go, Windows XP, not supported. Um, those are the better. You might even find a little bit of that. Uh, Windows 98. Windows 98. Uh, Asian uh, if you go. Yeah. So they're up there. Unpatched software. All right, we find tons and tons of unpatched software. Every, almost every pen test has unpatched software on there. It's like, hey, you guys need to do better job patching. You know, it's one thing if you find patches that are, uh, you know, maybe it's a month or two old. But when you find you know, systems that haven't been patched in four or five years, it's a pretty bad issue. And that happens a lot. It's not more than you'd like to see. Um, ESX servers, web server versions, um, old versions of PHP, we find an old Apache. Um, like those are, I'm just pointing out the really common ones. Um, and if they have WordPress, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, WordPress for the record, WordPress itself doesn't seem to have that many issues that have come up, but the plugins are just, they're really bad. It's a constant. If you've been watching the, in the, um, just the CDs lately, it's every other CD is a WordPress plugin. Pretty bad. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump over to another one. <laughs> I love the blue. Yeah. Another one, I didn't come up with my own. <laughs> so, padding Oracle on downgraded legacy encryption. I have to read that title a lot because I can never remember that. This is a good thing that they, so they actually gave out when they uh, a name. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Poodle a little bit first. So, Poodle is a vulnerability that only affects SSL3. Okay. Um, and it, it takes advantage of, it's actually um, a, a down, sort of a downgrade. And so we have a client and server negotiating their SSL. They basically figure out between themselves uh, what's the highest version of encryption that we both support. Okay, we'll use that. So that's that's kind of um, what it takes advantage of. Um, so SSL three, what's wrong with it? Well, first of all, um, it, you know, it uses uh, one of two ciphers, so RC four, which is already known to have a lot of issues with it, or some issues with it, um, and so it, the recommendation for quite a while before Poodle was to not use RC4 anyway, and then CBC is the is the other one, um, sorry, blockchain, and that's that's what Poodle is about, it's about barbell and the cyber, uh, cyber blockchain, which uh, basically they, they, uh, there's some padding in there, I don't, I'm not a photographer so I can't really explain it that well. But there's some padding in there where they, they change you know, which bits of padding or how many bits of padding they're sending along with the um, uh, along with the message. Um, and as a result, they basically have to change. I think they can figure out one bit at a time or something along those lines. So you, what ends up happening though is, is it takes 256 SSL3 requests to decrypt a single byte. So it's going to have to be a situation where it's the same information over and over again. The best example for that is probably so talking about like a cookie on a on a server. Um, there's probably there's other situations as well. That's that's one that, that really pops out as saying, you know, it would still take a lot of requests, 256 requests, just to get one bite out of that cookie. No pun intended. <laughs> Excuse me. Are you suggesting that that's not an issue to be concerned about, or no, it's a it should be to back to get a session token in real time. Uh, um, it, yeah, it means that you, you're not going to be able to get it instantly. It's going to take some time. Uh, not really. I think so. I mean, there are demonstrations you can go to a conference and you can see these guys attack a session cookie in real time. So, five minutes, you're right. 
you shot through the Wi-Fi. Right. Boom. So you got your bank session. So I'm, I'm not quite sure the point you're trying to get across here. Um, this is a serious vulnerability that can be exploited in the wild. Oh, absolutely. I'm not saying this. Oh, you just need the amount of data that have to be processed for each bit. It's a lot, so it's a substantial amount of data. Yeah. So, yeah. well, I, I mean, I'm sorry, with computers, 256 is not that yeah. much. No, you're, you're absolutely right. But still, 256 times the number of bytes, and yes, it can happen fast. Now, if you're doing what was mentioned earlier today, if you were watching the keynote, uh, Marcus mentioned several times, log all the things. So if you aren't doing that, you probably won't notice those 256 however many times. Yeah, but you can attack the just the client system this way. Right. Where the log of what it is, this isn't necessarily so just a piece of it. It's like a regular attack against, you know, yeah. let, me, let me move on. This will make more sense in a second. Okay. All right, so the, the issue is Poodle is really about a, <clears throat> it's a, an encryption issue. Okay, it's a, an encryption-based attack that's a concern. Um, but what I would venture to say is it's good. Be aware of it. Do what you can about it. And it, but it's not the most critical SSL issue that we find. It. And that's that's really what I'm getting at. Is yeah, we find Poodle, but when I run a scan across the network, I very frequently, very frequently run into lots of weak SSL configuration stuff that's weaker than that. So I'll find. Um, Old, um, use of old ciphers, I find SSL2. So I don't know why you're so worried about SSL3 when you haven't even fixed SSL2 yet. That's still on your systems. Or weak ciphers, like support for 64 or 56 bit ciphers. Um, you know, these things need to be fixed first. Um, it's not saying don't fix Google, it's just saying. You know, why, why focus only on Poodle? Because just because it's in the media, oh, let's go fix this thing. It's like, well, wait a sec. We also need to fix all these other things, too. You know, we can't just fix the one thing that shows up just because the newsman said it, that that's what needs to be fixed. We should be looking at our entire system. So, um, other things that we see a lot, password storage. Now, this one I don't really run into during automated scans so easily, but during the pen tests, um, you know, if we do get a peek at uh, a database that has passwords in it, it's still not uncommon to find MD5 hash um, passwords in there. Often without self help. So basically, self help is make the, uh, uh, each password more unique based on the track. Um, now, MD5, for those who aren't familiar, uh, it's a, an older hashing algorithm, super fast. Um, easy to crack just because you can generate lots of them really quickly. So, um, what you'll find is there are um, rainbow tables out there, you know, all of the internet basically that, that'll do a lot of this work for you. So, you don't even have to patch everything, especially if it's not solving um, or breaking. You can often group them. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty easy. Um, and unencrypted services. So, again, why are you worried about Poodle when you have? an FTP without any SSL sitting on the computer, right? Yeah. You know? And in the middle of that, I don't have to do any work. It's already done for me. Well, to be fair, I mean, there was a, when the, let me make sure, Hartley broke out, um, it turns out that if you had had an HTTP unencrypted, then that's not going to leak information about other people's sessions, even though you have trivial man in the middle or or, or sniffing. Okay. So it's a, you're trading one for yeah. the other. Um, so I, just. I, I agree. <laughs> Heartbleed is an exception. So uh, we're going to talk about Heartbleed next. <laughs> 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 Good timing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually set that up. Anyway, <laughs> someone's going to ask about that. Uh, no, you're right. But Heartbleed really was an exception to the rule. Um, normally, you should. I mean, we, we know this. This is what we tell everyone. You should be encrypting um, any sense of data on the network. Uh, so, Heartbleed. Um, Heartbleed is actually the result of an implementation flaw, and the reason why um, HTTPS is not no longer expensive. So, you remember, probably, those of you who have been working at this for a while, probably. I don't know how long ago, I don't really want to date myself, but uh, there was a point in history where a lot of people wouldn't implement HTTPS everywhere because it was expensive, 
there was this handshake that had to happen every single time. And, um, and you know, they didn't want to incur that, or they had to go out and buy expensive, um, yeah, accelerator type solutions to basically make this work decently. Um, that's no longer the case, and part of the reason that's no longer the case is because of the heartbeat that was introduced in, um, in Harvard. So, we had a heartbeat heart extension, documented RFC. Um, and basically, the, the heartbeat extension, um, what it does is sort of keep alive the type of um, mechanism that's in place. <coughs> So, you know, client or one of the three, you say, hey, I'm still here, say hi if you are too. And then you get your um, response back. I, that's the extent of my PowerPoint. <laughs> Bob and Alice. <laughs> so, that's basically it. Um, so, that, that's, that's a heartbeat message. Now, what happens with heartbeat, um, I'm sure a lot of you probably seen here as a different example of this. But basically, you have you know the request for the, for the heartbeat. Um, you have your, your payload, you know, the message that you want to connect with that, and then you tell it how long the payload length is, and then the response message says, "Okay, hi," and it just keeps going until it fills up all that payload length. Um, it's only slightly more complicated than that, but not much. Pretty straightforward. So we're able to actually pull stuff out of memory. You know, whatever happens to be in memory after. After the, like, the end of high in this case here. Um, so a lot of the main concerns that have been expressed around Heartbeat is the ability to capture <coughs> passwords or keys, things that are likely to be in memory on that end. Um, probably not data in the database because usually the database is not on the endpoint. But um, if you happen to be able to, to hit a database, then you might be able to do that as well. But it's also it's unpredictable exactly what you're going to get back. It just happens because. We don't know from the outside exactly what's in memory and how it's been managed. Um, it's just that we're just going to get back whatever we get. Um, so, to kind of put this around now again, what are the types of things that we see as a pen tester that kind of fall into the same category? We talk about passwords and keys. Use them to call credentials. Why do I need to use Heartbleed to find your password if your password is password? Or, you know, Damn it! <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Admin. Wait. Admin, admin, yeah. Admin, admin. Admin, admin. One admin, admin. admin. That's all I'm saying. Right. There you go. Yeah. Company name one. Admin, one. Right. 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 Yeah. Security. Yeah. Yeah. Secure now. I have numbers <laughs> and characters over there. So, yeah, we can ask for that. Um, default passwords. Um, lack of two factor. Lack of two factor. Uh, um, that's all over the place, so though. That's another story, though. Uh, I can rest of mode. So, I don't know how many of you have actually seen or run into that. I've run into it all the time. So, it's an old, uh, it's an old uh, vulnerability associated with a particular mode of operation for VPNs. Yeah, um, the hardware is set that when it is fixed with the vendor. Yeah, it's like, exactly. Yeah, you know, it's basically, there, there is no patch for it <laughs> or no way to change it. But um, there is, there are things that you can do to, um, to make it. Uh, a little less vulnerable, so just changing your keys around frequently to make sure you're using very strong passwords. Um, but basically, that allows you to pull the key out with a single request and then you can try to, to um, decrypt it offline. Um, unencrypted session cookies, so you know I have that um, the secure uh, keyword under your setting cookie, um, so that sort of thing. So I'm going to actually switch over to one that happened this year, because this is one that I actually spent a fair bit of time messing around with. <coughs> uh, there was a vulnerability called Universal cross site Scripting. It's specific to Internet Explorer, but it was specific to all versions of Internet Explorer, or at least the most recent, like four versions, which came out in January of this year. Um, and what this is, uh, it's actually not a cross site Scripting. What's called the universal process script, that's what the media called it. Um, it's actually a, uh, it's a bypass for the same origin policy. So same origin policy, um, that's basically a, uh, it's a security feature in your browser that prevents scripts that come from one place running against 
um, other places or other origins. So without this working, basically the whole internet would be completely compromised by process of things. It would just work everywhere. So the bypass itself, in this particular case, is actually very specific. It was had to do with iframes. So you're basically loading some content from somewhere in an iframe, and then um, you basically trick the browser, the JavaScript engine in the browser, into thinking that what's in there is actually from the same origin that the script is running. So therefore, it's okay to access it. That's really it in a nutshell. And for those who've actually delved into this, the uh, the proof of concept that was out there, there was one available on the internet you could go play around with. Uh, it actually had, there was a pop up you had to accept, a button you had to press. Um, I messed around with this and got it to a point where there was no user interaction required at all. So I could actually get it to run on the inside of a VM on, on IE and it would just like, instantly just start working against whichever side I was targeting. So pretty cool. I didn't publish that though, it's not something I want to know on the internet. <laughs> Um, it sounds really, really bad because it just works, you know, especially against an organization that uh, uh, has you know, Internet Explorer as their standard browser. Um, good thing that it's been fixed. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, the, the date on there, yeah. 09 of June 2004. Um, in the vulnerability, where was it? CERT. There we are. Um, a vulnerability that very closely resembles this one. In fact, it could even be the same one. I don't know for certain if it is, but it really looks like it is. <laughs> I mean, they both involve iframes, they're both the same origin policy bypass, they're both executed in very similar fashion. One was from 2004, the other one's 10 years later, there as well. So, it kind of makes you wonder was this vulnerability in place over that 10 years? It might have been. I don't know if it was ever fixed. I, I never found any evidence that the 2004 plot was fixed. So it doesn't mean there isn't. I just I never found any. So talking about iframes, I know I'm kind of picking on a little thing right now, um, but uh, you guys, you guys, any of you remember seeing this one before? The pixel perfect timing attacks. Um, basically, Paul Stone, he he uh, issued a white paper that there's a technique on here for. Um, Using, you would use basically the, um, what is it, the, the filters, the HTML5 filters for doing like text shadows and things like that, uh, to pull pixels out of an iframe. So an iframe that that JavaScript outside shouldn't normally be able to access, it could at least determine based on the time and how long does it take to render um, as, the, uh, as it's going through the filters. So. For example, like if you do a really big uh, drop shadow on something, it might actually take half a second for that pixel to render. I'm exaggerating. Versus uh, if, if the pixel is black, versus a lot less if it was you know, quite a space away. Um, so with that, along with um, um, OCR technology, so your object character recognition, that's how you can take um, something that's basically an image and, and infer text from it. Um, Basically, is able to, to read data out of uh, those blocks. So that's another one that has to do with iframes. Um, protection from iframes, for right now, best thing we can do is use the extreme options headers. And I still run into lots and lots of websites that come do this even though they have information on it that they should. And it, this is a small thing to fix, it's not really a big deal. Um, adding, adding the same header on things. But it's so easy to put ask right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing to just keep an eye on is the CSP content security policy. Um, I, you know, being a developer and looking at this thing, I can see that it's probably not going to be adopted very quickly. CSP is is complicated. You can't retrofit an existing site to use CSP very easily. You pretty much have to rebuild the whole thing. So uh, it's too expensive, I think, for organizations to actually entertain. Um, Fixing old websites and making them CSP compatible. So, all right, so that's pretty much everything I want to say. I do want to bring up two other points. Marcus brought up at least one of these earlier, um, and these are two things that we see a lot on Pentas. And I don't have a zero day to a specific zero day to mention these, but just all of them sort of 
together, this is another thing that we notice often, is first of all, are you monitoring the logs? Are you logging all the things that's part of the center? Um, and a lot of the time, things are simply not being logged. I mean, I run into this you know, internal tests all the time. Hey, are you logging this? It's like, well, no, there's logging there, but we just haven't turned it on yet. Same thing as Yeah. Everyone's chuckling. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you have to read the logs too. Yes. Right? So, yeah. that's, that's the other matter too, right? So, the logs are there, but uh, we just, somebody looks at them maybe once a month. Um, I actually will have tests sometimes where yeah. they are monitoring the logs, but it's sort of a weekly or bi weekly process. And I'll get a I get an email from somebody or a phone call and say, hey, last week when you were doing your test, were you doing this? <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's kind of late to be asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what if I say, no, it wasn't me? <laughs> when are you going to do that? <laughs> oh. Oh, that's what you were Yeah. <laughs> but I, it's okay. I always got to clarify that with clients, too. So. You know, if you see something weird on your network, and I'm doing a test, don't assume it's me doing a weird thing. I mean, it's, it's because you see your port files. I'm not going to need port files. I'm just going to test. Right. So, um, the other one is already scanning. Uh, it's, it's really depressing getting on site <laughs> to a client and um, basically spin up an automated scan to, to start things off. And you realize that they either don't even know what a scanner is, um, never used one before, or they um, they used one and they looked at it, but they've never actually actually done anything from the scan. And except for risk. Except for risk. Yeah, yeah, except all the risk. Can you characterize maybe an average customer size or whatever? Just like I can see a, a 10, 20, 100 person shop. Really not being into this versus say you know big enterprise customers or financial customers. I find this across the board. Okay. And I had a 475 person defense contractor who said we put Palo Alto network firewalls in, so we're secure, right? Yeah. And I said, Oh, I'll go on that. Who reads your logs? I mean, that's good. That's I'm glad you got a firewall. It's all right. I mean, how often do you read the logs? And they literally turned to me. Is the IT director there? Yeah. Network, everything goes in logs. So my point is, you know, like I've worked with, with small shops. Yeah. No, this is not really don't really have the expertise. Don't want to think about this. Want to hire someone to come in and help you. Yeah. yeah. And then of course, with the big enterprise customers, you would think you really should do a lot better. And yeah. you've got billions of dollars of aspects, though. But we find it across the board, and it doesn't mean that everybody is really bad. I mean, we find a whole spectrum. So there are some clients that actually do a really good job. But I, the point is. There are a lot of them. There are probably the bigger risk for the smaller shop because they did not have the insurance and the means to track it. Well, should this happen? Yeah. So I think that's where it's so like for us, a lot of our clients, you know, if you have a five man team, you can't afford maybe a thousand dollars an hour to not they work. Right? What we do is we look at okay, the big dogs who pay the premium price and they rightfully should be charged the premium price. And we actually take a loss on the hours that we spend for smaller guys because it's just important for them to get security. That's I think that's kind of how we have to adjust as an industry. Stop trying to make you know hundreds of thousands of dollars off these people who not even put on about the security. Let's face it, what do they do? They go off the shelf and buy it. And, you know, it's just you want to know that just means it's free bad it's just <laughs> enterprise, right? And that's their security. So there's ways we can offset it to help them just educate our kids. So here's my, my takeaways. Um, definitely evaluate your zero days as they you know when one comes out, take a look at it, determine what your risk level is with that. Uh, address it. Um, don't forget and keep fighting a good fight if you're running into uh, management barriers um, on, on fixing all of the old things and all of the, the vulnerabilities that are already there. Make sure you're doing your monitoring, make sure you're doing your, your logging. Don't forget about the little things. Um, just because, hey, there, there was a vulnerability at one point in time that had to do with iframes, but then that went away, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. Well, it, there have been several actually with iBrains that have popped up over the years. And it is a small thing, it's not something we really worry about so much, um, but maybe we should still take care of it. And that, that one, I mean, iBrains, I pick on that one, that's um, that's something that developers should be aware of as well, because they're, they're so amazing. <coughs> and that's, that's pretty much it, so thanks everyone. Yeah, I guess we're going to
Any questions? Yeah, I'm just curious. Like your points two through four on the previous slide, I'll make sense. Mother has apple pie. I mean, you can have two good points for your client. But what do you suggest they do point number one and to evaluate the risk of your own? So oh, I guess they're not known. Is well, it well, just to be monitoring well, other sources? You know, they're seeing when they come up and maybe they have to get patched. <laughs> I'm just curious. What do, you oh, what, what do we do? Uh, how do we discover when there are? No, how do you? If your takeaway is to evaluate risk of zero day. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Okay. Um, I guess I should clarify that once a zero day becomes public. So obviously you're not going to know about a zero day if it hasn't been announced yet. Right. Um, so what I, what I meant by that is so all of these, if we take a look at the end, that everything that came up with like shell shock and the uh, heart bleed, when something like that becomes, you become aware of it, it becomes public knowledge. Um, there should be a scramble right away to say, okay, well, how badly does this impact us? Okay. Um, evaluate it, and is there anything that we can do immediately to address some of the risks associated with it? Right. can no longer make because they have proven themselves incapable of weighing the risks. And amongst those, I believe, is um, two-factor authentication, especially, or other things that we know as a community, it needs to become just something that the developer just does. And if the client rejects it, they should, the developer should resign or charge way extra money to, to show that this is a negative decision that you're making. And because we're ethically obligated, we're not just going to do it. So the default should be the reasonably more secure option. And, and, and stop letting the business people decide because they can't make a decision. It's like, no, buy the $300 of UDPs and use them. Like, you don't have a choice. Right. But that actually creates problems too. So security is kind of tricky. There's a cost. There's analysis, right? So we actually just had a conversation about this at one of the breaks earlier. So one of the major banks here, one of the first things they said was, we want to change passwords and force people to add two more characters to their password and change them on a 90 day period. And we're like doing that. They spent 10 times more money supporting uh, phone call from customer service and creating issues and block brand recognition by keeping it simple. So the dangerous part there is, while any of us, I use UDP, we are all, all about two factor, there's certain instances where Think about the people that you meet on the street and you talk to a lot of time. I mean, they can barely remember their past. Well, right? the, the customers right. may not be able to, but if you work for the bank, sure, internal yeah, security right. pay, it's not an option. Right. And and right. right. Internal security is one thing, though. You have to think about it. You I can't just say blanket everybody. External security is tough, though, because you have to think of the consumer. You're never going to stop it, right? Because uh, if, if, you, if you attack that consumer while he's getting in there, the two factor still means nothing because you're not validating who's using that two factor. Factor once again, so it doesn't really solve the problem, it actually can create more problems if not done. But I absolutely agree with the inside of the I just think there's a big there's a cost for it. And to say that they're not doing that, almost every global 500 company that we've dealt with, they actually do an extensive amount of assessment just to see well, 
what would the implementation of this, this two-factor RSA token cost? Which, by the way, if I recall, RSA was free. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one more follow-up to that. So even on the internal aspects of that, when, when they, they when you make the complex on your own users, you're adding costs, you know. Uh, I mean, so any security thing you do, it costs a lot of money. It's gonna, it's gonna cost you gotta weigh the business. I think security is supposed to support the business. And like I said, my mission and his mission is just let the let the people be able to do their job. And I just kept the air on ways around, right? What is it? How many people's parents turn off their antivirus and keep popping up while they're trying to do stuff? Like, we tried to improve it, we just made it worse. I mean, the user should almost be oblivious to the fact that security is there because you're training them right. So, about the developer residing, it's possible, but it's really tough because you've got a lot of contract developers and investors with money. Sure. We've got a lot of developers. You know, over here in this country, we're, we're fairly spoiled for developers. There's, there's a lot of them, they get paid very well, and it's an incredible market. Um, I, I'm not looking for any of the JS people right now, they're out. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's tough in other countries. I mean, there's, there's developers looking for 10 bucks an hour or less. Irrespectively, uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a business decision to do these things. It's not a technological decision. The, 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 because honestly, from, from a business perspective, if you don't build what I want, I'll just find someone who will. It's a business decision. It's not a developer education decision. It is a wonderful thing to have developer education, but business people make the decisions you have to deal with that. Realistically, you have to impose that from above. I've been working with NIST uh, a very little bit and working with some lighter people. You know, the, the new NIST standards that we have, we have SPA 100, 171, and 160, go get a copy. Okay? So, especially whoever it was that said about developer education. Hey, Jenny, propose the right solution, right? You have to bring those questions to me and ask the questions the right thing. Just make sure you have something back of the story and you can and respect that even though it makes sense from your perspective, there is a higher power and cost to me. And that's, that's the tough part because from a tech standpoint, I thought everything that I'm with here, I'm like, you know, if you're gonna sit in the locked in room with double locks on the outside and not touch anything, it's just it's just not realistic. It will cost me money and it cost me clients money. That's definitely a challenge. Um, just great discussion overall. <laughs> um, very good discussion. Uh, it's I mean, my, my take on it is um, it is a challenge. We have different groups with completely different goals um, that basically we have to, they have to somehow work together in order to get to where we're going. I mean, we see, uh, not even, even taking the business out of the equation for a second, you see the same types of issues between just security and development. Um, where they, they're not they're quite lined up with the same page on how they might do something. So it's, it's tough. Well, I don't have the answer for you. <laughs> but figure it out. Make a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's probably uh, if, you, if you have to answer, that means everybody would be out of touch. So yeah, right, right. Very good. Great. Okay. Uh, we have lunch.